Welcome to Faith in Politics, a show dedicated to discussing issues surround the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics, or are your politics starting to shape your faith? In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson, and let me introduce you to our roundtable of regularly scheduled panelists. First, we have with us Mr. John Ashme, who's a senior assistant counsel at the Yale New Haven Hospital. We also have Ms. Nia Johnson, who's a visiting assistant professor at Duke Law School and a health policy PhD candidate at Harvard University. We have also with us Ms. Blair Marley, who's a corporate counsel at Thermo Official Scientific. And we have Mr. Andre Wang, who is the general counsel and the director of public affairs and religious liberty for the North Pacific Union Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. And I just want us to get started with segment one. Segment one is talking about the fact that we have people who are regularly refusing to engage in reproductive health care because they're patients of religious hospitals and they decline to provide sterilization and other issues. It seems as though we're starting to see this combination of individuals coming to the hospitals and having to deal with reproductive issues, but balancing that against their own religious concerns. John, could you give us a little bit of color as somebody who probably deals with a lot of these issues on a regular basis, exactly what this is all about and how it's impacted impacting even what you're doing on a daily basis. Sure. So, you know, what, what you're talking about is a situation where someone is employed by um, a health system or hospital or the hospital itself, um, you know, is grounded in religion. Uh, it's, it's owned and operated by a religious organization. And so the question, you know, typically occurs that when someone comes in for treatment and care, uh, to what extent, you know, um, is the hospital or the employee legally bound to provide the care and treatment that they're requesting? And, um, you know, th th these are very difficult issues to navigate um, for health systems, um, you know, because they're subject to a lot of federal regulations. And, um, and so, you know, it it's just they, they have obligations in terms of uh, providing care, but then you're dealing with an employee who may have very strong religious views on, on certain types of treatment. And so the employer is then now bound to try to accommodate uh, their specific needs. And so these are some of the issues that come up um, in these cases. Well, Nia, I got to ask you this question. When you're trying to balance the idea of you have medical individuals who are trying to, you know, comply with the Hippocratic Oath and doing the best that they can to save people's lives, and people come in and say, well, I have a religious belief that causes them to think that it may not necessarily be in their best interest, what is the requirement of the hospital or the doctors or those who are in this leadership position? Well, I think one of the most important things we can do, um, you know, whether that be in the hospital administrative space or even, you know, through lawmaking procedures, is understanding that many of these laws surrounding reproductive rights have really been centered on women who have been considered to be the ideal in society. You know, women who do not struggle with fertility, women who are married, and generally also women who are white and are not black, brown, or indigenous. And so when we don't take into account those type of interests when we're developing these type of policies, we push out a number of issues issues that we know are actually true. Not only do many women struggle and pregnant persons struggle with infertility, but there are also many women and pregnant persons who also need life-saving abortions to make sure that they actually don't die on the table. And I think some of what's been misconstrued here is a belief that that could never be you or that could never be another individual that you know and care about, when in actuality, hospitals know that this is actually very common. And so our procedures should take that into account as much as our churches and um, religious organizations should as well. But Blair, I got to ask you this question. We talk about the fact that you have individuals who come in with religious beliefs. What do we end up dealing with when we have the actual hospital that tries to operate on some religious beliefs? How do they end up juxtaposing what they believe may be in conjunction with what a patient might believe? And how do they best handle that? Sure. You know, I think the biggest thing we're looking at here is the do no harm part of the Hippocratic Oath, where we say we won't do harm. We won't, we will make sure that people have what they need to get the care that they need. And being sure to kind of separate church and state in that instance. Um, we've seen this happen time and time again, especially recently where religious organizations will try to say, hey, these are my beliefs and I do not support providing reproductive health care or providing that life-saving care as Nia pointed out. Um, but that is not set up in court. And, you know, at least at the highest courts, you know. And so as we see states trying to push this and trying to say, well, you know, your rights, you know, in where, where my begin, it's actually not... Um, 
it doesn't actually like sit we're supposed to um you know on the healthcare platform you know andre when we start thinking about these type of issues where do we end up balancing when you're working with religious organizations and how do we end up letting people know that maybe your religious thought process may actually end up killing you Right, yeah. So I, I I happen to serve on the the board of Evanist Health Portland, uh, you know, our, our hospital here, and and we had a board meeting uh, just just yesterday where we were reminded that while the hospital is under the Evanist Health system, uh, and therefore you know a de facto religious uh, hospital, we are not a Seventh Day Adventist institution or, or employer. And so you know, to to the consternation of 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 many uh, you know Seventh Day Adventist members. Uh, the delivery of care is not Seventh Day Adventist healthcare, but healthcare. Um, healthcare delivered by practitioners and clinicians committed to uh, the mission of living God's love by inspiring health, wholeness, and hope, which is which is the Adventist Health uh, motto in the in the delivery of care. So, um, you know, so that's that's an important distinction to, to make between denomination and and healthcare institution. And and here's here's an interesting data point that was shared with us is, is that of um, you know, of, of, of all the um, the uh, the DNC procedures, abortion procedures that were performed in the Havnis Health uh, System, and actually this actually kind of uh, jives with the other uh, systems in in North America. All all of them, all the procedures were cases where one, the pregnancy was already in the stages of miscarriage, uh, or two, the patient had sought an abortion and it wasn't performed correctly. Uh, and properly, and and so those were of of all the procedures. Those were the two circumstances where that was uh, uh, where that happened in Adventist Health uh, hospitals uh, over the last year. Now, John, you're actually in a hospital system that's not considered to be quote unquote a religious organization, but you're an academic institution over there as well. How does the academic component sometimes jive with the healthcare issues when you're dealing also with people who come in that have religious concerns that may have nothing to do with the academia aspect of it or even the best interests of their health? Sure, uh, you know, when, when these situations arise, the best thing that we can do is to give the patient um, you know, make recommendations, but you know, patients are free uh, under many circumstances to choose to receive certain types of care and to choose to reject it. I, I think the situation that becomes very complicated when it is a child and uh, this person is not an adult, and then you know, you have. Um, I think the the institution has additional obligations, maybe to make reports to the child protection agencies to intervene. Um, uh, with the court system to act so that, you know, the best interest of the child is uh, protected. So this best interest of the child concept seems to be the one that comes into play to some degree. But when you have a situation where that child actually is engaged in part of the process where it impacts also the health of the mother, you know, how do we end up juxtaposing whether it's a religious standpoint or from a hospital standpoint? Nia, where do you kind of fall on that side? Well, I think there are two different um, things to take into account. And, you know, I, I definitely agree with much of what John is saying. I think, like, there are times when you do have minors who are put in situations of pregnancy. And so that's one component where when we're thinking about, like, whose best interests we're dealing with, like, we also have to take into account, like, what it takes for a minor to carry a child to term. And we do know that in the United States, our maternal mortality rates are abysmal compared to the most of the developed world. And so we don't necessarily have the infrastructure, given what we've been seeing, to look put minors in these type of situations, which is why the abortion right is important. The second component is, you know, we also have to look at our history and understanding that the rights of children, though, well, actually, I should say the rights of children are distinct from the rights of a fetus, right? And so the court has not opted into <clears throat> deciding where does life begin. And so we have to make sure that we're mindful of, like, what legal terminology we are using and how we can impute, impute some of our religious beliefs on what we believe about pregnancy and how it's a wonderful experience and how everybody should want to have children and in juxtaposition with what the court has actually said when we're dealing with these things from a legal standpoint. I'm going to have to let that be the last word, but this looks like this is a topic where we're going to be seeing things going back and forth for quite some time. Let's get into segment two. 
Segment two is an issue that I think might be kind of interesting for people of all walks of life and even all faith bodies to understand, that Pew Research has been going out and doing a lot of data checking. And one of the issues they've been talking about is why it looks like church membership is starting to shrink. And the group that looks like they're leaving the quickest are listly the millennials, the Gen Xs, the Gen Zs. And it begs the question, what is going on and what is it happening from a, a cultivation standpoint where it appears as though there's a younger generation that doesn't feel the same about church as maybe their parents did? Uh, Blair, what's your thought on that? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great uh, thing to point out. You know, I will say recently, I actually did um, a poll on my personal Instagram page trying to understand why Adventists in particular in my age group, my millennial, were leaving the church. And I made it anonymous. I said, whoever wants to respond can respond. Whoever doesn't, it's totally fine. I'm just curious, right? And I got a lot of responses, shockingly. And they, were, they ran the gamut, but the one thing I kept seeing, it was resounding, was... People in my age group, Nia's age group, kept saying it is the rules, it is the hypocrisy, it is the lack of concern for social justice, it is the lack of speaking out. Um, there seems to be a large concern um, as it relates to our world church about giving people the tools that they need to speak up for themselves in hard situations beyond just polite jargon. And I think a lot of what, what we're seeing from people in my age group in particular is they're fed up. They're tired of it. A lot of us are multi-generation Christians, and in particular, in this instance, Adventists. And we began to ask for the hard questions. Why do we do things this way? You know, why are there these rules? Why are there, there are these traditions? And there's this really, this big climate of tradition over truth or truth over tradition that I've seen a lot of from my social media followers and just friends. And, you know, just kind of pushing the, that a bit further, looking at people of color. You know, a lot of the people of color that responded to that have said, they don't stand up for me when people are being murdered in the street, you know, who look like me. There's no comment. There are very few you know, moments of, hey, you know, let's let's stand with the black and brown community. It's a lot of silence. People are really getting fed up by that because they're seeing the bigger picture and they're thinking to themselves, if your God is like you, if your God follows your traditions and your rules, I don't need to do with him, you know? And it's a it's a really sad reality, but we're seeing it day in and day out. And so we're losing the millennials at an expeditious rate because they're sick of the fake and phony. And that's just what I've seen. And that's what I feel like I've dealt with with my friends who have left or who aren't as engaged as they were when we were growing up. Nia, what have you seen as you've gone through? I mean, I'm sure there are other experiences and, and other reasons from your dynamic. What's your thought process on that? Well, I think I have two um, thoughts coming after Blair. I think she made some really, really critical and important points. Um, I do want to say, you know, I think there's a bit of a misnomer when we talk about, um, quote unquote, younger people leaving the church. And I think, you know, depending on your denomination, that could just mean people under 50 <laughs> leaving the church, which is telling <laughs> it of itself. Um, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that there are actually just more options for gathering and discussing religious thought. Um, you know, like there was a time where you had to go inside of a church building to do that. Um, not only only do you have online streaming, but you also have different platforms um, like through podcasts and other avenues, a more, um, you know, religious opportunities to engage that doesn't require you going into a church building and be subjected to some of the norms that I brought up earlier, right? Like, what does it mean to be a quote unquote ideal woman? What does it mean to be a quote unquote ideal man? If you just remove yourself from that setting, you don't necessarily have to deal with those things. And I think that's important. Um, another component, and I think this is not just present in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but we've seen this in other religious institutions is the unwillingness to include other voices um, from the pulpit level. The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not ordain women, and that means that there are certain leadership positions that women are not allowed to be a part of, and that feeds into our education system, amongst other things, which means that when we talk about who is administrating our schools, who is administrating the conferences, who is administrating churches, we are getting a male view. And a male-centered view has led to a lot of hurt, harm, and destruction for women and children. And we have been unwilling to remedy it by allowing for other voices. And many individuals, including millennial men, have stood up and saying that women do not need to have that same voice. And so if churches have shown themselves to be hospitable for one particular gender and also not welcome the perspectives of another gender, then actually the only people who can thrive in a church environment are either men 
or women who align with misogynistic ideologies. And so that pushes out an entire population of people who feel like they could integrate into a society there. John, that's a pretty scary diatribe as it relates to what we're looking at from a young person's point of view. I guess the question is, as we listen to that or you listen to that, and you obviously have some millennials even in your own household, how do you juxtapose that against some of the information we've heard regarding how do we continue to connect with younger people in our church? So, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Blair and Nia have shared. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I would recommend we listen to them. Um, speaking as someone from an, a slightly older generation, at least that's how I'd like to look at it, um, I think my generation and the ge generations before, you know, we held certain institutions sacrosanct, uh, you know, the church, schools, hospitals. And, you know, so whatever they, these institutions did, we accepted it, we didn't challenge it. But I think the younger generation, you know, they are willing to ask the difficult questions. And if our institutions aren't measuring up to those very difficult questions, they're not going to invest in them like we, the, the older generation has. So I think that is really the challenge um, that we are facing. Um, our institutions are not practicing what they're preaching. And if you're not practicing what you're preaching, our young people are going to walk. Well, Andre, this seems to be something that's cutting across many different religions. This is an issue happening in Catholicism. This is a happening in Judaism. This is happening in the Baptist church. I mean, this is a conversation where what we're talking about happening is happening across the board. How can everybody across the board be having the same issue? Right. So and I think it boils down to that people, and, and I'm talking about people of all gener any generation, they're not making connections and finding community in the church. And when, and when I say church, I'm not talking about a, a building where we worship, but a community of people that supports and enriches our, our spiritual journeys. And as uh, you know, as, as Nia pointed out, I mean, it goes it now goes beyond our spiritual journeys. It be go, it goes into our 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 our, our professional lives and, and 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 personal beliefs. And 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 what's a you know what's a um, what's actually a major concern of um, within the Adventist Church now is the lack of young people who are not only uh, in the church, but then how are they going to serve the church in professional capacities? Um, there's just a critical dearth of, of, of incoming pastors uh, and teachers, but, uh, but, but also finance professionals, legal professionals, um, uh, plan giving and phil phil philanthropic professionals. Um, you know, the, the professional survival of the church actually is, is, is really in, in the balance uh, when it comes to the next generation to come. Well, I'm going to have to let that be the last word, but one of the things that we're seeing is this is just an issue that's cutting across all boards. It doesn't matter what your denomination is. It doesn't seem like we're connecting with a younger generation. And I think part of it is the messaging. If they understood some of the things that were going on a little bit better, we might find ourselves in a different situation. Well, let's go on to segment three. Segment three is talking about a very interesting case. And this particular case has been one that has been moving along for quite some time, helping people to understand the idea regarding a transgender situation. And so I wanted to take a look at what we call Dignity Health versus Minton. This particular case started talking about a man who was denied, you know, being involved in what they wanted to see happen at a Catholic hospital. And again, we're now talking about religion and health care. Here we're talking about a Catholic hospital system. Andre, can you take us a little bit through that and help us to understand what's going on? Sure. So uh, this this is a 2019 case out of uh, California that um, uh, that it comes out of the uh, their court of appeals. Um, uh, uh, Minton was a patient in the Dignity Health Hospital. Um, Dignity Health is a, a Catholic um, affiliated uh, hospital, uh, and um, and uh, Minton was a transgender patient um, uh, seeking, I believe. Um, uh, hysterectomy procedure. Well, um, the the hospital uh, corporately declined uh, and denied um, Minton's uh, request for the, uh, the and, and canceled canceled the surgery. Um, so um, Minton sued. Um, uh, Court of Appeal held that Minton um, could pursue a claim for discrimination based uh, on the cancellation of the surgery. Uh, but the court uh, also said that Dignity Health does not have. The constitutional right to violate California's non-discrimination law. So um, uh, there was a uh, there was a, 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 a writ of cert uh, that went up to the Supremes, uh, and they declined. Uh, they declined to uh, to take on uh, this 
this issue. Uh, further stopping uh, attempts to authorize discrimination against uh, transgender people under the guise of uh, religious liberty. But then, uh, then shortly thereafter, in June, if if uh, we you know we all remember, uh, uh, the Supremes then issued the unanimous decision in uh, Fulton v. Philadelphia. Uh, so um, yeah, so so interesting, uh, yeah, inter interesting uh, a fact pattern, but also an interesting application of. Uh, of what religious religion clause uh, standards uh, and tests the court applied. You know, John, when you're in a situation where you have a patient, where do you draw the line at a hospital system when they want to have their quote unquote free expression um, that's tied under the First Amendment? How do you end up juxtaposing that against what you've got to do there in your hospital system? Uh, so my, my hospital is not a religious hospital. And so some of the challenges that exist at the dignity system would not um, occur within my hospital. Um, you know, a, a, as a baseline, you know, what you're looking at, I think dignity is facing, um, you know, I, I don't know what the, what, whether or not California has a refer and what it actually says. Um, as you know, the uh, refer on the federal level um, the court, you know, ruled in, in an earlier case that it no longer applied to the states, but certainly it ongoing to the federal government. And so um, I think a lot of hospitals um, from a religious uh, standpoint um, are dealing with whatever local discrimination statutes uh, that exist within their jurisdiction, and they have to comply with these statutes. You know, Nia, I got to ask you, it seems like one of the issues that we have here is a lot of these issues are being decided from a confederation of states perspective. Would it make more sense that at some point we actually have the Supreme Court come in and maybe make something the law of the land so that we find something that makes sense as it relates to health care and not getting in concern whether or not you're a religious organization or not a religious organization? You know, this comes back to much of the dialogue about the right to help, right? And what does that actually mean for different individuals? And, you know, as much as I would like to say I have faith in the court to, um, you know, execute this type of... Um, policy issue in a way that's actually very inclusive and, you know, equitable. You know, given the previous rulings we've seen in the past, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, but I think it's also important for religious organizations to remember that you did opt to be in business, right? Like, you opted to not only function as a religious institution, you decided to outstretch your arms. Um, and what it meant to just, like, you know, be an aid to the community is not the same as actually running a major business where your main clientele is everybody else who doesn't necessarily believe what you believe. And so going into business is an opt-in procedure. You have to get incorporated, right? You have to get, you know, all sorts of certifications and what have you. And so that means that you do actually have to care about people that are not just within your constituencies or view every opportunity as an evangelism opportunity because healthcare institutions do serve a functional purpose in society. And that's important to keep in mind as well. You know, Blair, when I take a look at what we're looking at here, the whole idea of engaging in activities and having free speech and also making sure that there's a protection that's taking place as it relates to health care, it makes you wonder whether or not the whole idea of medical procedures is now starting to take on more of a free speech concept as opposed to what's in the best interests of the individual who needs a medical procedure. You know, what are your thoughts or what have you been seeing along those lines? No, absolutely. I completely echo that sentiment. I mean, a lot of what you're saying is people saying, okay, my faith is more important than your right to help, like Nita said. And I mean, there is a lot of dialogue and a lot of... Uh, dialogue back and forth on both sides about what does it mean to have a right to health and is health care really a right and depends on which country you live in to be honest with you right um but more more important than that is you have people saying you can't have a typical medical procedure a hysterectomy which most people who are assigned female at birth are able to have with no issue because of the way you have decided to live your life down the road right right we're looking at minton who's a transgender man right so minton still presumably, had the parts to have a hysterectomy, which a person assigned male at birth would not be able to have. And if Minton had come in not appearing that way, right, if, if Minton had decided to, to mute, right, what um, he believed to be his truth, no problem, right? And so what we're truly seeing here is an act of discrimination and saying, okay, well, it's my right, right? The First Amendment gives me the free exercise clause, but actually not in California. California has the UNRWA Act, which essentially says that you can't discriminate against all of these protected classes. And under that is sexual orientation and gender identity or gender, right? And so what we're looking at here is not just an issue of, hey, 
you can't get this procedure. It's you can't get it because I don't like how you look and I don't like the life choices that you have made. That's completely unacceptable and completely inappropriate. Not only does it cross a significant barrier in saying, I'm right, you're wrong in the way I believe is better than the way you believe, it is truly a violation of your oath, as Nia pointed out, to be an organization just to serve the community and the community at large, right? It, there are so many laws and I could spend a lot of time talking about how we have made safe havens to make sure people get the care they need regardless of standing in, in poverty, you know, or financial standing or, you know, religious standing. And so to say to somebody, you can't get this procedure because I don't like how you look or your life choices have been made is completely inappropriate. And the desire to try to shield under that, under the First Amendment free exercise clause is completely, completely ill-founded. John, I'm gonna give you the last word on this. It sounds like what we're looking at is healthcare is gonna turn into forum shopping. You know, I'm gonna look for the hospital that does what I need for it to do, or I'm gonna look for the state where it works best for me, but I might be making decisions that may not be best in my own interest as it relates to healthcare. You know, I mean, if we're gonna talk about this from a religious perspective, I don't, I, I don't see any instance in scripture where Jesus turned anywhere, anyone away who came to him for treatment and who was in need of healing. And so I think that's probably the best way for all healthcare institutions to operate. Uh, you're in the business of healing. Let's treat everyone that comes your way. That's a great way to close it, that if you're in the business of healing, let's just treat everyone that comes your way. Well, let's go to our last segment for today, and, and I'm going to start off with you, Nia. Nia, tell me something I don't know. Tell you something that you don't know. So I think it's really important that we know that many of the states that ban abortions um, before the second trimester also have not engaged in Medicaid expansion and also have comparatively low infant mortality rates compared to the rest of the United States, who also have a, at large a very bad infant mortality rate compared to the rest of the developed world. And so as we think about abortion policy and states' rights in the future, it's important to remember that, you know, if there's going to be an influx of babies, that we need to be prepared to take care of them. Andre, tell me something I don't know. After the 2022 midterm elections, President Biden will announce he is not running for re-election, and the first Democrat to announce uh, his candidacy will be California Governor Gavin Newsom. Wow. <laughs> Blair, tell me something I don't know. Yeah, um, there's a high number of people who have to get abortions due to their miscarriages and their them being so close to being, um, you know, either having to push a baby out or have a stillbirth. And with the current rate of, I'm sorry, Andre's news just shocked me, but with the current, with the, with the uh, current rate of, uh, you know, people who are being forced to take pregnancies on that they don't want to have. We are also not just seeing an influx of babies, as Nia mentioned, but we're also seeing an influx of uh, higher uh, mortality rates. Wow. John, we're going to end with you. Tell me something I don't know. I think Andre is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's a prediction <laughs> we'll let it end right there then so uh listen appreciate you guys being with us today thank you for helping us to tackle this really tough issue as it relates to health care and religion i want to also thank our audience for being with us today and uh want to make sure that you understand if it's about god and government it's faith and politics see you next time